You're listening to The Robin and Boom Show, the place where we engage the contemporary world with the great tradition. Wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, or elsewhere, you'll find us there. And now, here's today's co-host, Robin Phillips. Hello, everyone. I'm joined again by Dr. Philip Carey. He was a guest on our podcast last week when we talked about everything from Plato to erotic love to Gnosticism to things you can buy at the mall. It was a fantastic conversation. So do check out the Robin and Boom Show archives. It's number 15. Now, we ended that conversation by talking briefly about human flourishing. And that is something we want to look at again today, um, or at least one of the things we want to explore. Uh, We have a lot to talk about today. We're going to be looking at issues of modernism and postmodernism and the context that this creates for ethical thinking. Um, And once again, I'm um, delighted to have Dr. Philip Carey here. Thank you for um, coming to have this conversation with me um, in Jason's absence. Jason is um, Jason will be with us shortly, but he is occupied right now in uh, his doctoral studies, uh, working on his thesis. So, one of the problems we run into when we talk about ethics is something called the "is ought" problem. It was famously pointed out by David Hume, and it's basically the idea that you can't infer ought statements from is statements. So from a description of how things are, um, you cannot reach values and moral obligations. You can't logically make that leap from what is the case to what ought to be the case. Now, this has created a big problem within meta-ethics. How do you philosophically justify moral obligations and ethical thinking? What ultimate metaphysical legitimacy is there for grounding um, ethical statements. Now, this maps over um, to the, well, kind of maps over to the contemporary distinction between facts and values. So often in the modern world, there isn't any middle area between what is factual, uh, what's factual on the one hand, you know, what what is observable and scientific, um, and mere opinion on the other hand. So if someone says, oh, this, this is just my opinion, then the implication is that it's just up for grabs as if personal beliefs about non-empirical matters are outside the realm of rational elucidation. And this is the late flowering of this unbridgeable gap between is and ought. So Dr. Philip Carey, can you explain to us why this is a uniquely enlightenment dilemma? Right. It arises first articulately with David Hume, as you mentioned, who's an Enlightenment figure. And we can think of Enlightenment, the the Enlightenment period, as as sort of the the heartland of modernity. So it's a distinctively modern problem that comes to clarity in the Enlightenment. Um, Why does it happen there? Well, Alistair MacIntyre, one of probably the greatest living philosopher of our day, diagnosed this as a failure of the Enlightenment project. Um, That is to say, the is-ought gap is the sign of a failure and a loss. Um, The loss is the notion of, well, I'm going to put it in my terms rather than McIntyre's, but but I think this is essentially the um, the same sort of thing that McIntyre is going after. The loss is the notion of a truth about the good. That, that there is such a thing as a true statement about the good that is that's true. It's not just your opinion. It's the truth. But, of course, you can also get it wrong. That's the thing about truth. If you believe something is true, you could also uh, be believing what's not true. And that's why you need inquiry. That's why you need Socrates. That's why you need philosophy. Because there's a truth about the good that you can also get wrong. Um, now, David Hume observed that you can't get from a statement about is to a statement about ought, or he at least said, how do you do that? He he, he essentially raised the question. He was reading all these books where uh, uh, philosophers went from is to ought, from a statement about what was to a statement about what ought to be. And he said, I don't see any justification for that move. Could you give me a justification? Well, it turns out in one way, it's a very easy 
uh, thing to give that kind of justification. Um, the example that McIntyre gives, uh, which comes from another philosopher, is uh, you say, um, uh, Tommy is a sea captain, so he ought to do what a good sea captain does. He ought to do what a good sea captain ought to do. Right? Now, how did that work? You went from is to ought by looking at the notion of a role, R-O-L-E, right, a sea captain, and the good that that role is supposed to serve. Right? A sea captain has various jobs to do that he has to do well. And, you know, of course, well is just the adjectival or, or adverbial form of good, right? He's got a good to pursue. He's got a practice that he's involved with. Um, say he's the captain of a fishing boat. Uh, this is a, um, the team has to work together to achieve a good. Um, farmers have to do that. Any uh, social practice which is aimed at uh, a, a, an outcome that is a good uh, has roles where you ought to do what, um, what, what that role fulfills or what that role is aimed at. Now, you could say, oh, well, the roles, those are just what we want. And so all you're doing is saying, this is what you do in order to get what you want. So what you do need is a notion of the good, of what, of what is not just what you desire, but what you ought to desire, what is inherently desire, desirable, what is good. Um, I've noticed, for instance, that my students, when they talk about what's good, will put the word good in scare quotes, what's considered to be good, right? They do it all the time because they don't actually believe that there is such a thing as a truth about the good. Um, well, what, what Aristotle and Plato and Socrates all, would all agree about, there is a truth about the good. And when you lose that notion, McIntyre is saying, you end up with this is-ought gap, you end up with a fact-value gap. You don't, you, there's no way of getting from a statement about the way the world is to a statement about what we ought to do. In order to restore that context where, where is leads to ought, we need some notion of the good or what Aristotle would call final cause or telos. So the last capstone that brings it all together is just imagine that there is a good for human beings as such, not just the good of being a good sea captain or the good of being a good farmer, but the good of being a good human being. Uh, what you earlier, uh, Robin, called um, human flourishing, Aristotle's word for this in Greek is eudaimonia. It gets translated into Christian language as beatitude or simply happiness. But it's, it's not just feeling good, it's the fulfillment of our nature as human beings made in the image of God. It's what we were made for. And we ought to do what we were made for to fulfill the role, not just of a sea captain or a farmer, but a human being. And that's how you get from is to ought. Human beings ought to do what leads to the human good of flourishing um, and ultimate beatitude and happiness in God, uh, Christian theology will say. So, so, so does the Enlightenment movement and um, modernism, if you will, that it spawns, does that undermine the conceptual basis for some of these things like an, a truth about the good, final causation, uh, f flourishing according to our nature. D d d does it leave us bereft of, uh, uh, of, of any context in which these concepts can be meaningful? Right. Um, McIntyre argues convincingly, I think, that what we have now is fragments of what used to be a coherent context and a coherent tradition in which all of these ideas together made sense. Now we have fragments. We can still talk about what you ought to do, but we can't give it a, a basis in, in the world of facts. So what, when we talk about what we ought to do, what we're typically doing is we're, we're trying to manipulate each other and we're expressing our emotions and saying, you have to do, uh, you have to fulfill my emotions, otherwise I'm offended and maybe um, uh, I'll scream at you as, as is happening in colleges, college campuses these days. Um, things fall apart because all we have are the fragments and, and morality turns into an expression of our emotions. Um, we lose these things because of something that gets lost in the early period of modernity in the Enlightenment in particular. Downstream from modern physics, we lose the notion of final cause or teleology it's called or the telos or the truth about the good. These are all roughly equivalent terms. Right? The, the notion is that there's a built-in good that things are aimed at. 
That's Aristotle's philosophy. And that was the dominant philosophy until the late uh, 17th century or so. The Enlightenment is living in the wake of, of modern physics after Newton, where you don't have final cause. You, have, you only have what Aristotle would call material cause and uh, efficient cause. You've got matter in motion, little billiard balls at, at the microscopic level bumping into each other in Newton's physics. So there's no final cause there. There's no good or end uh, that is the, 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 the proper goal of our, of our movements. Whereas for Aristotle, the, the, the model for movement is, say, the growth of an acorn into an oak. Right? Be becoming a full-grown oak is the good for which the acorn has its form. The, the form and information in the acorn is aimed at that good. Well, likewise, we're rational animals as human beings. Our good is wisdom and virtue and a human life that's, that's worthy of a rational animal. Um, and that gives us a context in which we can say, you ought to behave justly, you ought to behave with courage. But lacking that teleology, that sense of a, the truth about the good of human life and human flourishing, our words start losing their meaning and to say what people ought to do is basically making an emotional claim about, about what you want them to do and, and attempt to manipulate them essentially. Interesting, interesting. Um, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but um, I think things will tie back to to this point, um, um, to to the point about um, the, the the Enlightenment undermining the teleological basis for for virtue, so that ethics just collapses into a power game. So so switch gears for a minute. Okay. So, oh, power game. That's a, a good way of putting it. Yes. 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 So we use morality to control and to, um, um, uh, the, a, a, an ethical discourse just becomes, um, these competing power games. Okay. So, 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 so that's the enlightenment. Now the enlightenment brought in the modern period, the modern period of, um, where, we deconstruct all traditions, um, and tradi tradition is viewed as irrational, kind of like on Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof, where it's just there, and we don't know why, and we don't have an explanation, but the Fiddler's just on, 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 on the roof. Why is there a Fiddler on the Roof? I don't know. It's tradition, right? So tradition means ignorance. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell us a bit about that, and then at the the postmodern insight that begins to unravel modernism. Right. So the Enlightenment comes after that crucial development in modern physics in Newton, where you get rid of final cause or teleology or the truth about the good. And the Enlightenment is also um, trying to, to shirk off uh, uh, the power of, of Christianity, which had become um, invested in state institutions, right? There, there were state churches, um, there were um, State churches were Catholic in Italy. They were Protestant in Germany. There was a Church of England. Um, and the Enlightenment wanted to say, let's take social power out of the hands of the church and of Christian faith. And you can, you can have your private faith if you want, but we're not going to have a public religion. So that, that secularizes the, the whole sweep of society. Um, and it means that tradition starts to look like a form of irrationality and oppression, especially religious traditions, but also um, older philosophical traditions like Aristotle, which after all was associated with the Catholic Church, uh, also certain kinds of Protestant scholasticism. All of that starts to look like irrational and oppressive traditions, and we want freedom and autonomy and individual freedom that is not subject to the irrationality of tradition. So you, you have Fiddler on the Roof again, um, which is portraying a traditional society, but the, the attitude of the of the writing of, of the screenwriters for Fiddler on the Roof is very modern. Um, if if a girl in that in that Jewish town wants to marry a, a, a Gentile, oh, tradition's going to say no, 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 you're not my daughter anymore. Right? Individual freedom is limited because the community has claims on you, and if you're going to marry a, a, a goy, a Gentile. Um, I've lost my daughter, you're no longer part of the community. Because the community makes claims on you that, that really impinge on your life. Um, and after all, if Jews don't marry other Jews, you end up not having Jews anymore. So the claims of the, of the tradition and the community are very powerful. And individuality in the Enlightenment wants to say, no, tradition's oppressive. So 
what you get then is an anti-traditional tradition. That's what modernity ends up being. It, it's, it's got two sides to it. One is this secularization of the world of Christendom. You can think of modernity as Christendom in the process of secularizing itself uh, because there's a lot of residual Christianity in, in this fragments that are left. The other thing is that it's this anti-traditional tradition that says tradition is irrational, it's oppressive, and then you end up just doing enough history and, and historical study in the 19th century to begin to realize, wait a minute, modernity itself is a tradition. It's a tradition that's opposed to tradition. It's a tra tradition that says all tradition is irrational. Now we've got a problem. It's what I call the postmodern insight. It's the insight developing within modernity that modernity itself is a tradition that's hostile to tradition. At that point, you can go in, I think you can go in two different directions. One is, is the direction that, that usually gets labeled postmodernism these days. I'll call it left-wing postmodernism, and it draws this kind of uh, conclusion. All tradition is irrational. Modernity itself is a tradition. Uh, there can be no thinking outside of a context of some tradition or other. Therefore, all thinking is fundamentally shot through with irrationality and depression. All thinking is, is fundamentally a form of irrationality, disguised irrationality, disguised power gains, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. And it's Nietzsche who's the first person who puts his finger on that notion, that claims of truth are really disguised power gains. That's all they can be because there can't really be such a thing as rationality because all of our rationality is really a disguised form of tradition and tradition is oppressive. So call that left-wing postmodernism. Nietzsche wouldn't have liked it because he was actually a right-winger, but, but he's been appropriated by left-wingers. Here's the other possibility though. Um, it, uh, I've mentioned Alistair McIntyre. I call him a right-wing postmodernist because he argues that traditions are the home of rationality. There are irrational and oppressive traditions, but there are also traditions that are the home of one kind of rationality or another. Um, there's no such thing as rationality as such, McIntyre suggests, just like there's no such thing as language as such. There's always French or German or Chinese or some particular language in some particular cultural tradition. Well, likewise with rationality. There's the, the rationality of Christian theology. There's the rationality of rabbinic uh, theology in Judaism. There's the rationality of uh, Islamic jurisprudence in Islam. There's the rationality of the modern sciences. But all of these are forms of rationality that inhabit traditions, and without traditions, they could not be what they are. So the idea is that uh, traditions with, if you have, say, if you have a Socrates in your tradition, if you have a self-critical element in your tradition, the tradition can be a form of rational human life aimed at a good that sustains a vision of what the good is for human beings and is therefore rational. So um, claims about truth, claims about morality don't have to just be power games. They can be ways of seeking the truth about what is good for us as human beings. Okay, so, so a left-wing postmodernist would hear this and they would say, um, yes, traditions, um, or the home of rationalities, but precisely because of that, our rationalities are confined within our own tradition, and they're watertight. You cannot you cannot communicate f from this one rationality, com one community of rationality, to another community of rationality. We're all trapped in our own um, micro narratives. Right. That's a, that's a certain kind of, I would call that late modern uh, relativism, right? It's, it's a relativism which says, yeah, we all in our own, own tradition and traditions can't talk to each other, right? Traditions are hermetically sealed off from each other. So, you know, in, in, it, it's also, <laughs> there's a certain, in, in certain trivial ways, that's true, right? In Japan and in England, you drive on the left side of the road. Um, when you get off when you get off those islands and get onto the mainland, you have to drive on the right side of the road. And there's, you, know, you just have to do that. Um, and there are certain forms of courtesy that you have in Japan that you don't have in the United States. And you, you can't say it's wrong. It's just how the Japanese do things. But can't it be that there are certain ways of treating people with respect and kindness and dignity that are true for all cultures? Well, 
there isn't going to be a neutral ground on which we can adjudicate these kind of issues. So, so McIntyre, as a postmodernist, argues, and this I think is the crucial uh, thing that all postmodernists have in common. There's no there's no neutral ground here. You're always at in speaking the language of some tradition or another. You're always using the rationality of some tradition or another. But the traditions are not hermeneutically hermeneutically sealed off from each other. Traditions can talk to each other. Japanese can learn English. English can learn Japanese. We can talk to each other about our traditions and maybe discover that some of our traditions need to be uh, critically evaluated. And maybe, say, some Western notions about human rights are things that Japanese need to be thinking about and, and incorporate into their tradition. So we can talk to each other. We can learn, above all, we can learn that we're wrong. We can learn that we're wrong about something. Our tradition, the Western tradition, can learn that it's wrong about some things. And that's precisely what makes it rational. It makes it Socratic. We can think, I thought that virtue was thus and such. I thought that virtue required daughters to always do what their father said. But you know, maybe that's a little oppressive. Maybe the Enlightenment is right about that. Maybe we should loosen up some of those rules. And a tradition can think about that and be self-critical. Um, and, and that's um, the, the key insight. That the self-critical nature of traditions allows traditions to learn from each other so they're not hermetically sealed off from each other. Excellent. Now, now that's right-wing postmodernism. A left-wing postmodernist, how would, how would they respond to this? Yeah. Um, from the left-wing postmodernist perspective, um, you've got, well, the, the, the serious left-wing postmodernists are, get beyond relativism. Relativism, I think, where, where you know, what, what's, what's good in Japan is, is good for the Japanese, what's, what's good for Nazis is good for Nazi Germany, right? You, you can't say they're wrong, etc. That, I think, is, is what I'll call it late modern. I don't think that's postmodern. It's still stuck in the notion that, um, that you need neutral ground in order to adjudicate these things, and you don't have neutral ground. Um, what happens with the left-wing postmodernist, they go in two directions, I think. One is um, the, the direction uh, you could associate with the name of Jacques Derrida. Uh, I, I, I crudely characterized it by saying, all of our thinking is irrational. <laughs> um, it's as if you're here with Socrates, and Socrates keeps on leading you into puzzlement, or aporia, he calls it. Right? Socrates, the people who talk to Socrates keep saying, I'm perplexed, Socrates. And Derrida suggests we need to inhabit that space of perplexity, and we never really escape from it, right? We never really can come to a truth about the good. It, it's really a version of ancient skepticism, which came from Socrates and said, yeah, all you get is the Socratic wisdom of knowing that you don't have wisdom. All you get is the Socratic perplexity, which undermines all the structures, the oppressive structures of our traditions. So we, 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 we inhabit our traditions ironically because we know that they don't really hold up. And that's just the end of it, right? There's no getting to an ultimate truth. That would be, um, let's call it the deconstruction version of left-wing postmodernism. The other version of left-wing postmodernism that's influential is associated with the name of Michel Foucault. And Foucault is kind of a Nietzschean. He's the one who suggested that uh, the claims of truth end up becoming what he calls a regime of truth, where truth becomes a form of power. Uh, claims of truth are really claims of power. It's as if it's all rhetoric and no logic, right? You, you, you don't really get to uh, a truth that we can all share. It, it, claims of truth become a way of, of playing a power game and manipulating in a society where it's everything is, is really the circulation of power. Um, and again, that's, that, that's sort of, well, it's downstream from Nietzsche, but it's a left-wing development of Nietzsche. Um, let me say one more thing about that that will bring us back to Aristotle. The great thing that Nietzsche saw that was, was deeply unmodern is that, um, that form is a source of power, that form is not simply restriction. Structure and form give power the way a well-formed piano player can, the move, well-formed movements of the, of the fingers of the, on the piano are what make music possible. You can't play the piano at random. It has to be well-formed. But Nietzsche then said, what forms us is violence. What forms us is power. 
the forms of things have to be beaten into you. Justice and peace are really forms of repression. And that's the un-Aristotelian thing. The, the great optimism of a right-wing postmodernism or a pre-modern view is that justice and peace and virtue are ultimately natural to us. Right? They're not a form of violence. They require discipline and self-discipline. They're going to require disciplining your child and disciplining yourself. But those are not really forms of violence. Those are ways of seeking the truth about the good. And that's what I think um, the left-wing form of postmodernism, going back to Nietzsche, ends up losing. Okay, so within what we're calling right-wing postmodernism, there's been a vibrant recapitulation of reflection about virtue. Uh, so tell us about that and how the recovery of tradition creates a context for thinking about virtue. Right. So the recovery of tradition has to be a recovery of inquiry for, for McIntyre. It has to be something like a recovery of Socrates, right? Because if there's a truth about the good, it's very important that we can get it wrong. Therefore, we must ask, is it really true what we're saying about virtue? Is it really true what we're saying about the good? So you can't just go back to the past and say, okay, I want to sort of live a traditional lifestyle and, and, and just do what, what my ancestors did. Um, the ancestors of the Western tradition asked questions. They learned that they were wrong and that they had to correct themselves. They were uh, involved in the conflict of traditions. And McIntyre talks a lot about how traditions are in conflict. A tradition, McIntyre says, is an ongoing conflicted argument about what the good is. So it's actually a healthy feature of tradition that people are arguing about what's good. Um, so Christian theology, you're, you're arguing about um, what uh, true and sound Christian doctrine is. Um, in Jewish rabbinic thought, you're arguing about halakha, uh, how, to, how to carry out the Jewish law. And the arguments are healthy. Um, that tradition of argument, however, does give you a coherent context in which to answer some of the questions and to decide, hmm, I think that uh, Rabbi Shammai uh, lost that argument and Rabbi Hillel won that argument. And, and, you know, and so Jews will live according to Rabbi Hillel most of the time rather than Reb Rabbi Shammai. But they remember Rabbi Shammai. Um, Christians will say, eh, there's some heresies that we're never going to believe in anymore. Right? Er what Arius said back in the fourth century, no, that's heresy. We're never going to do that. But um, maybe what Thomas Aquinas said is not what all of us have to believe. There's this other tradition with Bonaventure. And maybe when Luther comes along, he's got something to say that, that despite his severely critical attitude towards the medieval church, maybe we have to listen to that, right? And we have this, this, this conflict. Um, that makes possible um, a life in which terms like virtue and the human good actually make sense. Um, because what has to happen is that our, our virtues, which are a way of training ourselves, have to be tied to the pursuit of wisdom. The tradition makes possible this kind of pursuit of wisdom, which also makes it possible a vision of the good for human beings and what a good human being looks like, right? Not just a good sea captain, not just a good farmer, but a good human being. Um, that's still gonna be an argue, a, a, a matter of argument and conflict, right? We, we haven't reached the end of our inquiries yet. And that's the, the part that's true about left-wing postmodernism. We have aporias, we have perplexity, we, we discover we're wrong. We're, we're never perfectly rational. We haven't gotten to perfect rationality yet. But there is a truth about the good that we can aim for. In order to believe that, McIntyre ended up concluding, you're going to have to believe something like uh, the existence of God. And then McIntyre, late in his life, becomes a Catholic, uh, thinking that Thomas Aquinas is the true fulfillment of what Aristotle is going after. Interesting. Wow. So, so um, I like how you're helping to understand the big picture here within uh, the history of philosophy, and then um, and then bringing it down to what it means for virtue. And I want to get even more granular now, just to conclude. So, <clears throat> I want you to, you to imagine there's the this person named Susan. She believes in God. Uh, she's a Christian, <clears throat> but she doesn't really have a concept of virtue. She kind of just unconsciously conceives the Christian life as rules. That, oh, yeah, I have to. God has told me that um, this is wrong and this is right. And, um, and then she dis discovers this whole idea that through virtue, 
we can actually flourish and become more fully ourselves. What would you say to Susan as she begins this the, as she begins this journey towards rethinking ethics, less as just a bunch of rules and more as as being able to flourish according to her nature. What what would you say to somebody who's just starting out on that journey? Right. So um, the first thing is to say that the rules serve a larger purpose. Um, Thomas Aquinas is good at this. He has a treatise on the, the law of God. And he says, like any good legislator, when God makes a law, he does it for a purpose, for an end or a good. The law serves a good. What good does it serve? It serves the good of us coming to know the supreme good, which is God himself. So God makes laws in order to draw us into relationship with God, who is the supreme good, who is the source of our happiness, and the, he's also the supreme beauty. He's, he's, he's the, the most beautiful and, and, and the best thing there is. He makes laws to draw us to himself. And then there's this missing category, this missing concept called virtue. And virtue is not just about what you do and doing the right thing. It's about who you are, what kind of person you are. The reason why it's important to do the right thing is because that helps form habits which shape who you are so that, you, so that by behaving in a just fashion, you become more like a just person, the kind of person that God can look at and say, ah, well done, good and faithful servant. Um, the kind of person who lives a life worthy of being someone in the image of God. And that whole structure of doing the right thing in order to become the right kind of person, that is a virtuous person, to come to the state of human flourishing, which is ultimately union with God, is that larger context in which moral discourse makes sense and which the Enlightenment lost track of. Well, very good. This has been so helpful and enlightening to me, and I'm sure that I speak on behalf of our listeners as well. Um, I really appreciate you joining me for another week, and I just encourage all of you to check out Dr. Philip Carey's books and audio courses. He has a co course called, uh, he's one of the contributors in the course called The Great Minds, which is available through Audible and as part of the Great Courses series. So thank you very much for joining us. Do check out our website, robinmarkphillips.com, and we will see you next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. The Robin and Boom Show is made possible through the generous support of listeners like you. To become a patron of the show, go to robinmarkphillips.com and select the Robin Boom Show from the drop-down menu. If you have questions you'd like to have addressed on a future episode, send us a message through our Facebook page. Once again, thanks for listening.